Welcome and greetings to all who have joined the webinar on transphobia, understanding the plight of immigrant LGBTIQ plus in Europe. This is Amir Rana from OPP, the, your host and admin of the event. The event is a collaboration of overseas, overseas progressive Pakistanis and new women connectors. Wahid Bhatti, member of OPP's core group, and Anira Noor, executive director of New Women Connectors, shall be moderating today's event jointly. Before we start the event, I want to share some housekeeping items. As you know, this event is being recorded and streamlined on social media as well. However, only speaker's image shall be displayed. Therefore, no need to turn off your webcams. But I request you all to mute your mics and unmute when you are requested to talk. In the first session, the panelists shall present their viewpoint. Later, the floor will be open for all to comment and ask questions, but turn by turn. I expect the questions will be short and respectful. Since participants have joined from all over the world, therefore questions can be asked in English, Dutch, Urdu, Punjabi, and German, as we have participants who can interpret. You can comment and ask questions using message options as well. Now, over to Wahid Bhatti and later Anila Noor. Wahid Bhatti sir, please unmute yourself. May I request that you speak a bit louder? You know, uh, I could hear uh, Amir Rana, but as if from a distance. So if you could bring the mic closer, it would be so much easier to follow. Thank you so much. That's all. Wait, what is up? Can you hear me? Please unmute yourself, please. Unmute, sir. Hello, oh, Ranjit, sir. Can you move yeah, on to the next? Now, now please. Hari. Uh, okay. As uh, I mean, first of all, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I think it's uh, it's wonderful to have a discussion on this topic, which we have been trying to do for last uh, several months, and finally, big day. And we are very very pleased uh, to welcome all of you to this uh, very important uh, dialogue. Uh, before, before we uh, go into it, I'll just like to very, very briefly introduce uh, OPP to you. Uh, I mean, you can find all the details on our website, but as you see on the screen, the, 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 the purpose of OPP, why we started this group, it is a platform for the people of Pakistani origin to promote progressive values in a multicultural environment. Our vision is basically three words, everything summed up in a, in a very short phrase, which is unity in diversity. And this goes very, very well with today's topic. Our mission statement is uh, we strive to eliminate exploitation and discrimination through meaningful dialogues and with a lot of emphasis on meaningful dialogues. And again, uh, if we are against all kind of exploitation and discrimination, that goes also very, very well with today's topic. Uh, next slide, uh, Ransa. Uh, just uh, our inclination, because a lot of people ask, again, details are on the website about where do we stand politically, religiously, and socially. And we have just highlighted a few bullet points. Politically, uh, we believe in democracy. Uh, we believe in human rights and absolutely in gender equality. And again, that goes with, the, with today's topic. Our religious inclination is that we are for separation of the state and religion. Uh, on social side, we believe in inclusiveness, in integration, uh, in tolerance, uh, in acceptance, because tolerance alone is not enough. And we are pro-nature, uh, not just environment, but environmental issues are a part of it. Uh, can you go to the next one, Ranusa? Okay. 
uh, now I will hand over to uh, Anila. She, because we are doing this program together with New Women Connectors. And now Anila will do a brief introduction of New Women Connectors. Thank you, Vahid Bhatti. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy and welcome all of you to this discussion. My name is Anila Noor, and I'm a founder of New Women Connectors. It's a refugee and migrant woman-led movement. And though it's the name seems like uh, New Women Connectors are only working for women, uh, yes, we are specifically working for women, but for using women's voice, their lived experience and their knowledge of uh, their life. We are uh, talking about how we can change a perspective shift specifically in the policy debate and being living in Europe is really uh, gap. We found it. We have as a advocate of uh, inclusion. Um, uh, so we are working to use inclusion rather than integration. And we are trying to give a platform for refugee and migrant specifically specifically uh, women, refugee and migrant backgrounds to come and take policy debate as their right. And we are um, uh, making uh, and, and translate the policy debate for them. And in return, we are trying to bring their voices, their recommendation and the gaps as per they identify to the policy on the European level. Next, please. Yes, so uh, as I uh, mentioned, a New Woman Connector has a very specific uh, objective to uh, represent interest of migrants and refugee in policy debate and the uh, processes which is being engaged either is local, national or European level. And we really want to ensure the uh, gender equality, diversity and inclusion as a woman's right and human's right. Um, they uh, access their rights and they can be uh, promote their rights as well. And we are trying to contribute to build a positive and empowering uh, narratives uh, in the forced migration. And that's why we are involved in OPP as well uh, to join our adventure because we believe we are working uh, towards and within change is really important and key factor if we are talking about inclusion, gender equality and equity. Uh, being a part of a, a different high level, uh, global level network, we have been engaged on a global and European level. Uh, so if you can see, we already be quite uh, engaged in a global level. So this is like a quick uh, view of our uh, presence in, uh, um, on the world map. Thank you. And I'm looking forward for this discussion. Well, thanks, uh, thanks Anila. Uh... And as you see that this is a, a kind of joint event between uh, Women Connectors and, and the OPP. Let's now uh, get back to, the, to our today's topic, which is transphobia, understanding plight of uh, LGBTQ queer in Europe. Uh, why we have chosen this subject, uh, why we, the plight, because it sounds uh, too negative word. Uh, and uh, because we have uh, anyway, uh, the, the problems and issues related to queer groups of people, but we at the same time, they are immigrants. And then it kind of uh, is, if you add up two negatives, uh, then it becomes really uh, kind of plight. Now, or when we started organizing this event and this dialogue, uh, it has been a very uh, enriching experience for us. Uh, we, through the process, we got to know many wonderful people like uh, all of attendees, but especially our three panelists today, you will hear from them and hear about them. Uh, we learned a lot from the new friends we made in this, uh, if I may use the word community, uh, for lack of any better word. Uh, we learned a lot about, uh, about the happiness and about sufferings. We learned a lot about new forms of uh, love and new form of hate, uh, about repressions and about acceptance about fears, but also about the bravery at the same time. Uh, but we received an overwhelming support we never had before about any of the events we did. Uh, and that support and that enthusiasm from, from people really gives us hope that there is some hope. And we hope that the humanity uh, at the end will prevail and prejudices will be, will be defeated. Now, we see more and more people talking about that, hey, people are coming out of the closet and they are being more and more accepted. But that's not good enough because we want a society actually in which people do not have to go into a closet in the first place. I mean, there should be no closets at all where people can go in and then come out. So that that's, should be uh, actually abolished. 
Now, before we move on to introducing our, our today's panelists, I will just uh, uh, read one quote to you by Shelley Wright. And it says, I hear the word tolerance, that some people are trying to teach people to be tolerant of gays. I am not satisfied with that word. I am gay and I am not seeking to be tolerated. One tolerates a toothache, rush hour traffic, an annoying neighbor with a cluttered yard. I am not a negative to be tolerated. And I think this is very powerful quote because we, a lot of us, we believe that we are very tolerant, that we accept every, everything, we are very liberal, we are very open-minded, but there are so many undercurrents. There are the language we use uh, without sometimes noticing. And we think we are liberal. I mean, this thing came out quite clearly when we are having these discussions and demonstrations about racism. I mean, a lot of people you would have met, I met, who say, I'm not a racist. And we say, okay, you are not a racist, but that's not good enough. You have to be anti-racism. Just being not a racist is very passive. So if people somehow in, 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 in this context, in our today's topics context, say, oh, I am tolerant, I accept these people, that's not good enough. And I think we have to make this language and use of this language absolutely clear. And with that, I would like uh, Anila to introduce our, our three honorable panelists today. I must say we are absolutely delighted to have all three of them. The breadth and depth of their knowledge and experience is absolutely gorgeous. So please, Anila, go ahead. Thank you, Vahid Bhatti. Uh, so as uh, Bhatti Saab said, like we are really privileged and it, this is my personal honor to have a quite uh, um, diverse and global panelist uh, joining us. So we have a uh, uh, first panelist, Lilith uh, Khanum. Uh, actually, Lilith, uh, she is a trans woman with a migration background, and she's uh, working uh, for the rights of LGBT uh, refugees and asylum seekers in Germany since 2015. And since November 2017, she's working for the German-wide LSVD Project Queers Refugee Doves Land. Uh, sorry if I pronounce this wrong because it seems like a German word. Uh, the aim of this LSVD project is uh, queer refugees uh, Deutschland is to network the structure existing uh, throughout Germany as well as refugee LGBT activists and to support them in their work, which is very important. So thank you, Lilith, for joining us. And then um, we also have uh, Dr. Lane Monir. Uh, Dr. Lane Murid is a legal and political anthropologist uh, examining the intersection with the uh, sections of gender politics, law, and forced displacement from the global south. As a senior researcher, a research for, uh, fellow at the University of Rwanda, she is now uh, taking a comparative approach in examining uh, post-colonial uh, pro uh, political environment, and she's uh, taking out specifically a uh, case studies. Um, uh, from Pakistan and in her case studies, uh, she is currently working uh, uh, to make it a part of a book as a chapter and the relationship of uh, diasporic uh, big transgender Pakistani into the Europe and their family which are back in Pakistan. She also uh, published uh, our, uh, uh, kind of uh, on the drivers of asylum seeker by LGBTIQ of Pakistani migrants and their uh, subsequent uh, challenge which they are facing in EU system. And um, uh, 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 Dr. Lane, she's really active coordinating to UNSW uh, a Calder Center of Refugee Law in, uh, in Australia. And she's also part of emerging scholars of uh, practitioners in uh, migration issues. And obviously she has uh, amazing uh, knowledge uh, in her background of uh, education from Columbian University. And our last panelist is amazing. I know her um, very well from last few years, Tina Dixon, and I, I have the privilege to uh, see her activism on the global level where I met her uh, in Geneva. And Tina Dixon, uh, she has worked um, in the area of LGBTIQ refugees and women's rights, both in Australia and overseas. And Tina has a very solid experience engaging with the international human rights bodies, such as Tina, also been involved um, with the development of Global Compact of Refugees in UNICEF and also even uh, Global Refugee uh, Forum, which happened first time in Geneva in 2019. 
and uh, Tina is really trying to focus on the inclusion and mainstreaming of age, gender, diversity, and this kind of sensitive approach in the forced migration. And uh, Tina, she's uh, currently uh, a PhD candidate and writing thesis on the lived experience of queer refugee women that are viewed uh, through the lens of trauma theory and concept of empowerment. Um, Tina has extensively uh, contributed to the public uh, discourse of people from the refugee background in specifically the queer uh, women raising issues such as intersectionality, ethics and representation. Uh, she's a co-founder of the Queer Sisterhood Project, which is amazing, a peer run sport and advocacy group. Uh, for the queer refugee and obviously for everyone who is uh, uh, trying to understand this kind of uh, challenges in Australia and outside. So thank you so much uh, everyone to be part of our panelists. So I will request Lilith to start this discussion and then uh, Dr. Lane and then Tina. So Lilith, over to you. Thank you, Anila. Um, hello everyone. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, taking your time out and uh, registering yourself for this event and uh, trying to learn something new. Uh, maybe I would also learn something new from you people today. Who knows? Um, so um, I'm a trans woman with migration background um, and I don't say that I come originally from Pakistan or I say things like that when I introduce myself because trans people it doesn't matter where they come from um, they face problems which are universal um, like all around the world it doesn't matter if you're living in Pakistan or you're living in Europe uh, the intensity might change uh, the way you look upon trans people is different from culture to culture and country to country given their backgrounds but uh, the discrimination that trans people face especially trans women um, uh, have to face is immense in all parts of the world so as you all saw the video I hope everybody has that video still in their mind uh, it talked about your biological sex uh, then it talked about your gender identity then your gender expression so once you are at the age of four five six you know if you are a boy or if you're a girl and you want to behave like other boys and girls and you want to either become like your mom or you become like your dad. And even as a kid, I would always say to my mom, when I grow up, I want to become like you. And she would like, no, you would become like your father. I was like, no, I am not going to become like my father. I'm not going to become like you. So I didn't know that at that time. Nobody knows when you are three or four year old who you are and what you are and with the passage of time you realize about yourself what's going on in your brain what's going on with your body and how your body and your brain they are not uh, aligned with one another and this was my case my body wasn't aligned with my brain my brain was uh, telling me all the time hey you you're a woman and after the puberty my body was saying no you're not so it's either you change your mind which I tried for more than 16 years and I failed in that or you change your body and not all people have to change their bodies uh, like that's another topic um, we can talk about it maybe in the Q&A round uh, that trans people come in all shapes and sizes and shades and gender expressions and they might or might not go through surgeries if they have to they uh, can if they don't have to they must not there should not be any compulsion about it but uh, let's come back to the topic uh, that uh, what about the plight of LGBTI people living in Europe so I came to Europe with, uh, um, with the hope that uh, I would have less discrimination I would have less problems in the mainland Europe I do uh, when it comes to the legal setups, when it comes to the state uh, and the state giving me the protection through the policies. But I don't live with the state, I live in the state and I live with people. And the people towards me, they are still discriminatory, uh, they are still uh, hateful sometimes. And 
being a woman is already very hard many people don't know that only women know that how hard it is to be a woman in a world made by men for men and uh, generating all those uh, stereotypes uh, against women it doesn't matter if you are a cis woman or if you are a trans woman if you are a straight woman or if you are a homosexual woman bisexual pansexual it doesn't matter if you are a woman you are already one step lesser than a man that's how the society works and it works all around the world like that so um, in Germany I do not have many Pakistani friends and the reason behind that, I would say, is the same hatred towards trans people, the LGBTI, the queer people. Uh, we are still tolerated in certain settings. Uh, we are still uh, looked down upon in all day life, like very simple things, in inviting somebody to your dinner. If you don't like queer people, you won't invite them to your dinner party. Extremely simple things like your birthday or going out shopping with you, uh, planning holidays with you, uh, things like telling or introducing a queer person, a trans person, a gay person, an LGBTI person to your other friends who are not LGBTI people. So all these things come into play even in the European countries. It was like that even back home. but. In Europe, I was expecting something different, but it's still there. And the problem is, I must say that, the problem is not you are trans or you are gay or you are lesbian or you are bisexual. The problem is, why are you not conforming to the mainstream society? Why are you not cis man or cis woman? Why are you not marrying a man as a woman or marrying a woman as a man and why are you getting into relationship with the same sex or why are you trying to be the other sex so i would say trying to be which is actually false uh, i see uh, the way i see that but that's how people perceive us this entire perception and even when i was transitioning my my, my therapist in germany would always say uh, but Lilith, you know that even in Europe, you are stepping down from the ladder one step and choosing or deciding, actually, that's the decision if you want to transition or not, deciding to go one step down than the men. And I was like, yeah, I know that. And we all women in this group as well, we, we all are aware of this thing. So... Uh, since I'm working with the refugees and asylum seekers, I always tell them and I always consult with them that life is although better here in Europe, but it has its own complications, it has its own problems and we have to uh, work together, we have to uh, contribute our expertise so that people come and listen to us and people understand us as well. because. Many people are afraid of us. I don't know why. I'm not going to bite you. Uh, I don't really. But you know that you think, okay, I am secure now. I have my uh, basic goals achieved. And now I have friends and I live in a secure country. But still there are issues which never go away. Uh, especially the shame that somebody wants to be associated with myself, uh, that somebody wants to proclaim that, oh, you know, um, I'm from Pakistan and I also have a Pakistani friend. She is trans woman. Uh, you don't have to tell that, but you don't have to op uh, out people to anyone. But just accepting that thing that you have trans people as friends, you have gay people as friends, lesbian women, queer people as friends. That thing should be very normal, actually. It should not be something that you should be ashamed of or afraid of or think about, I don't know if we are aliens. <laughs> we are not. I have a mother. Uh, I have a sibling. 
um i had my schooling as a young child um i went through all the stages yet you people go through but uh, my extra stage was realization of my gender identity and that's it that was something that i had to do extra maybe you uh, have your own milestones in your life as well that you had to achieve which was not maybe your gender identity or your sexual orientation but maybe there was something which was not conforming to the mainstream society it might be anything it it could be anything so yeah thank you thank you lilith it's really precious and very i know it's not easy every time to share your own experience and when you have that kind of ups and down journey and unusual uh, structure of life thank you so much it's really important and now i will request to dr lane uh, to share her views and her perspective uh, yes dr lane are you here i am here yes. thank you so much so yours thank you um i feel really humbled and honored to to be able to speak after lilith um i met lilith uh several years ago when i was reaching researching my book chapter and she has kind of been my guide to understanding the experience of of trans folk um across europe so i'm greatly indebted to her so what i would like to do i think is to kind of contextualize legally what lilith has experienced as an individual so what i want to do is situate the conversation within the pakistani legal system and then within the international or the european refugee system so i'd like to give some legal context to what's been said so um what i take away from lilith is um is that what lilith has expressed to me is that really the way that we can define social development cultural development economic development is how many options people have and so there's a great scholar of development name martia sen and he said a really developed society gives everyone lots of options and good options and a great way to understand people who have suffered discrimination is the opposite they have very few options and the options they have are very bad so for a transgender person in pakistan um the likelihood that your family is is understanding or supportive is is very low so then your very bad option is to move out of your family's house and then once you move out of your family's house it will be diff difficult to get a job so then you have the option of very bad jobs to choose from and then once you have these bad jobs your options when it comes to healthcare are equally bad so then you have different forms of discrimination and they pile on top of each other and it's extremely difficult to get out of this cycle in which one form of discrimination dr lane are you with us she joined from rwanda so maybe uh, she has some internet uh, connection problem she she has just uh, asked me that uh, her internet is not doing well so should we invite uh, meanwhile yes uh, we can uh, request then dr uh, tina dixon uh, so tina you are here um yeah i am yes hi I'm tina okay. yes thank you so you are always a savior <laughs> so please uh, the floor <laughs> is yours and share your experience and your knowledge with all of us because this discussion is very uh, i will not say very new but we really want to learn from your all experience thank you absolutely thanks very much anila and everyone for um inviting me to speak today um i am talking to you from australia and i hope that my internet connection doesn't become really terrible um so my name is uh, tina dixon i am currently a co-chair of possibly displaced people network which is the first organization um in australia to specifically work on the issues of lgbtq plus asylum and to be led by people with this lived experience I'm going to send um in the chat just the um links to our social media if um people are interested in following. Um we work across um the whole LGBTQ+ plus umbrella with everyone but today I want to specifically focus on those issues that trans people are experiencing in Australia but I believe 
that those things are really universal and they really resonate with a lot of um, things that Lilith shared earlier with us. Um, and uh, to do so, to share those experiences, I'm drawing on the report that was published last year as the result of Queer Displacements Conference, which was the first conference um, in our region to specifically talk about LGBTQ plus displacement, because it's really often that we hear about the plight of refugees or the plight of women who become refugees. And it's really rare that we actually do pay attention to those who very often um, flee not only conflicts and persecution, but simply the violence that's inflicted on them for who they are and who they love. Um, so the report highlighted that um, for a lot of LGBTQ plus people and trans people in particular, there is really a lack of belonging. And here we're talking both about ethnic and diaspora communities because those experiences of homophobia and transphobia are still prevalent and people cannot go to their communities being openly who they are and request support, but also within LGBTQ communities. In Australia in particular, we do see a lot of racism and xenophobia, um, so that people who are um, here part of LGBT community are not necessarily um, understanding what those with um, refugee status or still in the process of seeking asylum may be experiencing and what kind of supports um, they're requiring. We're also seeing a real lack of decision make, uh, training for decision makers. And this is both in terms of immigration decision makers, so those people who are seeking asylum um, coming to Australia on shore, and in particular in the cases of trans people, um, there is, I guess, this um, stereotype that as soon as a trans person says that they were you know, born to the wrong body, they're more likely to get a protection visa um, as opposed to them um, simply expressing who they are um, and not kind of fitting in those very um, single narratives. But there's also lack of um, training for services. We have a very binary data collection where um, any refugee service only collects data whether you are male or female. And there is no space to say you're trans because for example, you may have a different healthcare needs and you may need to be um, referred to the specific um, doctors um, and without the data collection, there is really um, not a guarantee that your services is going to be met. Um, lots of um, LGBTQ plus people in general, but also trans people in particular, are required to change their documents, to change their names. And sometimes it is for safety reasons for trans people, it is to reflect who they are um, and also um, do um, change gender markers in their documents. Um, in Australia, both are only possible once you're a permanent resident. Um, and within our migration context, um, migration system in Australia discriminates between how people arrive to Australia. And so some of the refugees can only get temporary protection visa, which are valid for three or five years. And that means that those people, um, especially trans people, cannot change their names just because they're stuck in this loop of always reapplying for protection once that visa runs out. Um, a very big challenge for lots of trans people um, is quality of interpreting services. While in Australia, most of the NGOs are supposed and required to provide interpreters free of charge, the question of training of those interpreters and their use of appropriate terminology remains really acute. Um, it's never guaranteed that you're gonna get a really good one. Um, and most likely those interpreters are also coming from um, your ethnic community, which increases the risks of disclosure um, in the instances where you actually want it um, not to come out to your communities. Um, in terms of access to housing as well, um, in the context where non-for-profit organizations are not collecting data on trans people um, becomes really tricky um, in case the service chooses a very, um, I guess, in a wrongful and damaging model where they settle people by their documents, which that means the trans people are going to be settled um, into the households um, with people who are not of, gen of their gender and increases those risks of violence and discrimination. In Australia, in general, for any person who is still in the process of seeking asylum, we do not have any income support. Um, and for trans people, that puts them in a particular precarious situation because you've got additional barriers to employment. Not only sometimes it's the lack of local um, experience or English language skills, but it's also, for example, when your 
representation yourself, you know, and the gender identity that you have does not match what's reflected in your documents. And so people really find it difficult to find employment. And with no income support, lots of people are driven to poverty, homelessness, and destitution. And then in general, we're still having um, discrimination in all areas of public and private life. Um, we at the moment with the government, they're trying to uh, lobby for the legislation that will allow religious um, organizations and churches and groups to discriminate using their religion and not to observe human rights. Um, we, as the Forcibly Displaced People Network, um, the first organization to be led by people with lived experience. Um, so for us, it's important that any conversation um, on migration, asylum, forced displacement, and LGBTQ plus refugees is actually centering those lived experiences at the forefront of the conversation. Because I think for far too long in these spaces, we've always been um, talking about refugees, not with refugees, and sometimes in very tokenistic ways, only asking people to share their stories and experiences, as opposed to have a equal seat at the decision-making table. So in the last year, we've produced a number of resources, um, which I'm also going to share um, in the chat box. So we have uh, did together with, um, I didn't mention the Queer Sisterhood Project, which is a specific um, queer refugee women's project. So we produced a cartoon, which was co-designed with women that talks about the experiences of cis and trans women. Um, and it's their stories recorded, um, written by them, recorded in their own voice. And then we made um, an infographics to, um, to prevent people from disclosing their identities because many of them are still um, in the asylum process. Most importantly, I'm sharing the link um, to the Canberra statement. Um, so this document has been developed last year as a result of Kuwait Displacement Conference. This is the policy guide that talks about very high level overarching issues that LGBTQ plus refugees are experiencing around the world. And it also sets out a number of recommendations for people to implement, to work towards, and sometimes it depends on what type of organization you are. For example, you can pick one particular area like access to housing or access to employment and work on that. And so we're asking people to affirm the rights of LGBTQ plus asylum seekers and refugees to safety and justice by signing on to this statement and then um, working to implement it. And later in the year, um, um, probably in November, we're gonna be hosting a webinar which um, explains in more detail what it actually means to implement um, such statement and what different steps, um, different organizations, but also individuals can take to make sure that their service is inclusive and that we're working towards um, a society where you can be who you are and have your human rights um, respected. And probably in the last five minutes, what I wanted to focus on um, is also to um, talk a little bit on what can various supporters do? And here I want to focus both on the ethnic and diaspora communities, but also on organizations, or whether you're just an individual who is interested um, in upholding and supporting their human rights. First of all, if from anything today that you hear, you were to, to only take one thing, I wanted to say that LGBTQ plus people existed in all cultures and across all societies. And very often we actually have to blame for this homophobia and transphobia, the colonization processes that brought those legislations in various countries and really policing people's um, lives. We all need to work um, to address and to prevent and to stop transphobia. Um, and we cannot be saying that we are supporting human rights or we're supporting LGBTQ, or sorry, the women's rights or refugee rights if we think that there are terms and conditions to that. Human rights are about every single person in this society. And I really liked how in the introduction, we were talking that it's not about the tolerance. Tolerance is not enough. It's about inclusivity and equal opportunities for everyone. And it's about the right to live your life in dignity, safety, and freedom. Sometimes um, it is really a minor change that needs to happen that makes people feel included. For example, pronouns. You may see that in my name and in Lydia's name, we put our pronouns um, here on Zoom. And it's really important that if we're talking about services or individuals, we're actually asking people what are their pronouns. So we're not misgendering them and we're referring to them um, and we're accepting them for who they are. Um, it's also really important that in all our work, 
we're centering the um, lived experiences of LGBTQ plus people who've experienced forced displacement. And is, I, I really see it very often that um, in the refugee spaces in particular or in ethnic community spaces, we are sort of talking about everybody as if it's a homogenous society without understanding that for some people there are those additional barriers to actually be present at their decision-making table. So for example, when we're thinking about um, places like Anila mentioned Geneva and Global Refugee Forum, it's really rare that um, LGBTQ people are there openly. Sometimes people are there, they are LGBTQ, but there are really a lot of fears and really tangible threats for them to be out um, and open about who they are. So it's important then when we're creating these spaces for consultation or the dialogue that we're trying to protect and to ensure that all of the safety considerations are in place for people to be part of the conversation and not to feel that um, once they're out to the community that will be some kind of repercussions. Because we're still talking about um, you know, this even in countries like Europe, in, you know, regions like Europe or in countries like Australia, where um, I guess you do have an expectation that come in here, you're going to be well accepted and then you still experience barriers to participation and, and meeting your needs. Um, and, you know, perhaps I want to finish that, um, you know, if we're really serious about human rights, women's rights, racial justice, this cannot be achieved without um, the trans people's rights. Um, and we need to make sure that in any work that we do, we're not leaving anyone behind. I will be happy to answer questions once we once we're done with presentations. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Thank you so much for sharing your all updates and your involvement and the work you are doing uh, for all the people who are really have flex access to raise their voice. Uh, so we will check with Dr. Lane if uh, she's uh, ready yeah. to share her talk. Yeah, she's back. Uh, I'm going to share her. Uh, Good. Thank you, Amir. Points. Yes. So Dr. Lane, back to you. Yes, thank you. My apologies. Network dropping is a daily part of life in Rwanda, so I'm sorry. Um, so I'll just uh, pick, off, pick up where I left off, and I'm going to talk more about specifically the Pakistani context. So Tina took us kind of like to the international policy level, and I'll bring that together by talking about Pakistani and international law. So um, one thing that we haven't talked about yet really is numbers to give some sort of a sense so there's no actual reliable number on the number of transgender people in Pakistan. Um, um, it's ranging vaguely from about 100,000 to 200,000. But again, as we remember from that video at the beginning of the presentation, it's hard to really measure because gender is fluid, right? And there's people who can express and there's people who can't. But um, the United Nations Human Rights Commission did publish a report saying that around the world, one transgender person is killed in a hate crime every two days in their um, study from 2008 to 2014 to give you a sense of um, transgender um, violence across the world. And that, that's only counting um, homicides. That's not counting other forms of violence. So when we bring that down to the Pakistani context, the best way to understand Pakistan is that it seems to have a par very paradoxical relationship with the transgender community. Um, and there are some prizes, there are some surprises that come out of Pakistan. So a lot of this, you can call it, I guess, legal schizophrenia or schizophrenia about, about transgender rights. Um, comes from this kind of long history that Pakistan has with the transgender community. Um, next slide. So, yeah, so this conflict, so there's clearly discrimination, which we can already imagine. But then historically, I'm using the word kawajasiras, which is the Pakistani word for, for the transgender people, uh, specifically transgender women. Um, they had very lofty roles under Mughal rule and they were allowed in places of power and royal palaces because they were seen as non-threatening. Um, anyone familiar with Pakistani culture knows that it's common to have transgender women come dance at a child's birth ceremony, to have transgender women come dance at a wedding. So at one, on one hand, Kwajasiras are very discriminated against. But then in other ways, um, Pakistanis invite 
transgender women into the most important days of their lives and the most important celebrations that they experience. So that's kind of the, the paradox that I'm, I'm referring to. And a lot of this paradox in studies that were done among Pakistanis is there's a very common confusion between a biological state and then your sexual orient sexual orientation and gender identity. So in attitudinal surveys conducted, I did my field work in Lahore, but in attitudinal surveys conducted across the country, including the North, it was a common misconception that Kwajasiris transgender women were biologically female or that they had um, uh, both male and female sexual reproductive parts. And so this confusion about the difference between biology and gender expression um, it actually has both, both pros and cons in Pakistan. So next slide. Um, so most people are very surprised when I point out that Pakistan is actually ranked um, by a lot of human rights organizations as the second most progressive country in the world for transgender people. And by some measurements has more transgender protections than any other country on the globe. And most of this started around 2009. So 2009 was this watershed year for transgender rights in Pakistan, because that's the year that the federal government allowed for the X category on legal documents. And that's the year that transgender people could mark transgender, or the word that's used, it's incorrect, is intersex, but it means transgender. It means not male or female. On national identity cards, in the national census, the, one of the questions asked about um, being not male or female, you can have an X identity on your Pakistani passport and you can be legally a transgender person on any of these documents and still inherit property. And so when you look at this, I mean, this is actually quite progressive. Um, and then the same year, um, Pakistan um, transgender population benefited from a bit of judicial activism and that just a handful of judges all at once actually set down rulings that were in favor of transgender rights and the most notable of that is the Supreme Court decision in 2009 to allow people with the X gender category on their ID documents to A vote and then B, also run for public office. So that was a great leap forward in, in civic rights for transgender Pakistanis. And then at the same time, that in that same year, all of this governmental funding opened up to help protect the transgender population. Um, one of the northern provinces allotted $2 million for um, the protection of Kawajasiras and set up a special a human Rights Protection Committee for Kwajasiras and the federal and provincial level governments allowed NGOs to open up and offer um, reproductive health services and I should say all sorts of health services and um, zakat and other forms of support to transgender populations and these nonprofits were given legal standing to do this. So in that sense, on the books, Pakistan is surprisingly progressive when it comes to transgender rights. But a lot of these, um, you can go forward, please. A lot of these legal um, developments, they're kind of fraught because one, they use biology-based definitions. And again, I use that word intersex and it's really misleading and it, it doesn't apply to Kawajasiras. Um, because that's actually about having male and female reproductive parts. And that's not what the conversation is totally about. And then sort of the limits of legal protections in Pakistan are also based on a lot of, I should, I don't want to use the word misnomers, or I can also say just disagreements about what Islamic law says about being transgender. Because on the one hand, like people point to Islamic scholars have published that um, every child is a creation of God. And therefore, if any child is born with both male and female parts, that's God's will. And like we work through that. But then again, of course, 
Pakistan is an Islamic Republic that follows Islamic law and homosexual acts are illegal. So there's also this kind of paradox in that in Pakistan, it's not illegal to be transgender. So it's not illegal to be born biologically a man and, and express as a female, but it is illegal to engage in homosexual acts. And Pakistani law has not quite figured out how to reconcile kind of that tension because in, in many instances, the, the two are correlated, but they're not necessarily the same. So, so Pakistani law and Sharia law, they're trying to figure it out still because it's a relatively new debate. And then in general, attitudinal surveys across Pakistan and with transgender women who um, have tried to engage in the legal system to push forward their rights, there's a general distrust of courts. Um, all census surveys show that people typically don't think courts work fast enough, they don't think they're fair, um, and they just don't think that they're an effective mean for like pushing forward the human rights agenda. So if there's one thing that um, I would like for my presentation to put forth, it's that Pakistan probably, I would argue of any country in the world, has the biggest gap between transgender protections on paper and then the actual social and cultural treatment of transgender people in society. Um, next slide, please. And so this tension on the ground in Pakistan causes a lot of problems for Khawajasiras who try to get um, asylum or who seek asylum and want to be refugees like Lilith has in Europe, is that when local police and local law enforcement doesn't protect Khawajasiras, they, they arrive to their country in which they ask for asylum without evidence of having been persecuted. Um, international law, and a study, um, Tina talked about this a little bit, is being either homosexual but cisgender or being transgender, there's a difference between visible and invisible categories. So then the question becomes for people seeking asylum, to what degree is being in the middle of the gender spectrum something that a Pakistani could avoid or mitigate or versus what, what, what can they not? So then that's a question they have to work out when they're going through the asylum process. And then another um, argument is that for many Khawajasiras coming from Pakistan, they have never had the life conditions on which they can explore their sexuality in a way that helps them answer the questions they need to answer during the asylum process. So for example, an asylum officer who's trying to assess whether a Khawajasira should be allowed to stay in Europe is gonna ask questions about sexual history. But if a, a transgender person has been in a place with no sexual freedoms, they wouldn't have had the chance to have a sexual history that would qualify them for refugee status. Um, in short, the Pakistanis, LGBTI plus Pakistanis, don't have life experiences that fit on the timeline that a lot of asylum officers want to be able to check their box to say that this person has been the victim of persecution. And then what's very common in, in Europe is that transgender Pakistanis are then housed with other Pakistanis who were seeking refugee status for other reasons. And then a lot of the ideologies and then the belief systems that victimize transgender Pakistanis back at home are reproduced in their refugee centers. And so they're really just living the same ideology, but in a smaller setting in Europe. Um, so then one of the, in some of my consulting that I've done um, for a Greek NGO, one of the, the tension that arises out of this is that if you look at Pakistani law on paper, it looks protective of transgender people, but then transgender Pakistanis arrive and they tell a story that is not compatible with all of these legal rights on paper. So there seems to be, a, there's a, a paradox that has to be worked out. Um, next slide. So the question I think fundamentally that Pakistan shows is that legal protections for transgender people far outpace 
common perceptions of the transgender community. So then I, I, it's a bit of a, um, a philosophical question is should domestic laws or national laws, should they be reflective of common perceptions or should laws, some people argue, laws should always outpace common perceptions to protect human rights in order to give society higher standards or new standards for which they should aspire in protecting marginalized populations. Um, so I'll leave, I'll leave with that thought and we can open up maybe to Q&A or, or another summary. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lane. I really want to thank uh, uh, Lilith, uh, Tina, and Dr. Lane to share their, uh, you know, uh, very detailed updates. And I will uh, hand over to Vahid Bhatti uh, for further discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Anila. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Tina, Lane, and uh, Lilith. I think very illuminating and wonderful uh, contribution from our three panelists, which certainly opens up our minds and gives us uh, tremendous new insights. Uh, without losing any time, would like to invite the audience uh, to brief contributions, if you wish, to make any remarks or to add something, uh, anything, your views, uh, in addition to what uh, our panelists have uh, said. And questions, uh, please ask any questions. Do we stay on the topic, please? And don't be unnecessarily long because we want to give everyone a chance to, to say something and ask a question. So please, who wants to go first? Yeah. Well, I just want to congratulate the three uh, presenters. I think this was very comprehensive. One, a personal experience. One, the policy dimension. And the third one is the discrepancy between what a law may say and the social practice of society. But I will, since there are so many people who can, uh, who would like to comment, I might have other things to say. I'll just say, I'll, I'll just uh, comment on the very last sentence the last speaker spoke about. Whether the law should reflect uh, what are the shared values or aspirations or prejudices of society, or that law should lead the way. I think the second, is the obvious alternative for us. Because for example, uh, in, in, in Europe, the death penalty was not a very popular, its abolition was not a very popular demand. And, and a few times when heinous crimes have been committed against children and all, people have demonstrated that bring it back, the guillotine. Uh, but the governments and, and so on have held on so the death penalty has been abolished. So I don't think there can be two opinions because what if it were so simple that society reflected the same as the modern standards of human rights, we wouldn't have a problem. Human rights are there to lead the way. Another example in this case is that of India, where uh, constitutionally they reserved uh, seats for the historically most deprived community, and that is the Dalits, and for the Adivasis, the Aboriginal people. And it was backed by political action, and now you have a very uh, uh, vocal intelligentsia from these sections of people which are protesting and uh, calling for reforms, because there's a huge gap between what the state says and practices maybe in the large in the urban areas and when you go to the villages. So to catch up is what is needed. I think the third dimension is the human rights movement has to step in the civil society to, to narrow the gap which exists. And in, I'll just say one thing because I don't want to take more time. In the case of Pakistan, I say Pakistan is not a coherent state. So if you have a law suddenly which some judges found uh, in the interest of the transgenders, you have all the other laws which are extremely repressive and the blasphemy law and so on. So there is a chaos in Pakistan. And I think it would be an interesting study how the judges could bring it forth. My suspicion is that the Sharia is not clear on this. Just like, for example, rape is not discussed in the Quran. And so it has been covered 
by what is known as, uh, uh, you know, uh, between two married couples, what is it called? Not fornication. Zina? Zina? Haji, Zina, Zina, no, no, no. Zina, exactly. Zina, and there is a, a English word for it, which I use all the time. Uh, you know, there is fornication is sex between unmarried persons. Adultery. Adultery, yeah, that's the word. That's the word. So now you have all these very repressive laws against uh, uh, rape, and they have sort of, through analogy, brought in what is applicable to adultery to cover rape uh, cases, which uh, General Musharraf incidentally did away with. So I think Pakistan and its progressive laws surprised me a lot just regarding transgender, but I wouldn't, I would say that it's a very happy accidental development. It's not something which is grown out of either the legal community thinking about it or the intelligentsia thinking about it or some intellectuals taking it up. Um, how it happened is a very fascinating uh, question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ishtiak. Uh, uh, any question from someone else? Anyone else? Please raise hands if you have any question or if you want to ask yeah, any question. Yeah. Uh, Mubashir Saeed, please. Yeah. Mubashir Saeed. Hi. Thank you. I hope I'm being heard properly. Yeah. Yes. Great. I would really like to congratulate OPP and it's very refreshing to hear that there is a forum for progressive values in gender and sexuality inclusive and environment inclusive. And I'd really like to focus on the issue of language and I think it's really beyond semantics. It's something that we have learned a long way in the last 20 years and the language that we would use 20 years ago, we wouldn't use it today. For that reason, I would have question mark, of course, on the word Will apply it also, but really, it's the it's the framework. And and when we are talking about advocacy, what kind of line of thought we are using? And I think, uh, like Lilith and Tina, it was very uh, nice to hear you. That it's about accepting basically as human. It's just you know uh, not condescending or patronizing in some way. Like Lilith said, it's not aliens. It's just not, you know, just accepting as human. Oh, I have a trans friend. It's not like that. Like Tina said, you can be who you are. And, uh, and for that reason, I think uh, I would also question the choice and relevance of the video played in the beginning. Because uh, I think we shouldn't sort of get so much into pathologizing the whole thing that, okay, you know, the, and there is emerging sort of uh, new information, the in discourse is ongoing in terms of uh, biology and genetics and all that, and there's no definitive answer. And like Dr. Munir uh, also pointed out, uh, the confusion about this whole biological stuff uh, in Pakistan and the confusion within the legal system. And, uh, and I think trans people are, it's, it's a broad spectrum. It's not just transgender or transsexual. Or trans, you know, it's, it's like there, there's a whole lot of diversity within that broader category. And like Dr. Istiak also pointed out, what is line of thought or what is sort of advocacy is really the human rights framework. It's dignity and choice and uh, freedom and respect that every individual uh, sort of requires. And uh, and then, you know, sort of, uh, again, uh, basically we are human beings and that's what, what is important. And I think that's what should be uh, sort of a uh, line of argument and advocacy, uh, especially for, you know, from a forum with maybe relatively uh, newer audience. I think human rights should be the framework to carry forward. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Now, Thank you um, I think, uh, yeah, Ramza, go Yeah, uh, there is a, a raise hand uh, by uh, Tina. I Tina. think Tina would like to, yeah. uh, yes. So, Tina, over to you. I just wanted to respond briefly to that. Um, I think I understand the sentiment and, you know, this is what I was saying in terms of the human rights, but I also think that in a policy context and practice context, 
it's important that we still acknowledge those barriers that people experience. And those barriers that trans people experience, they do not originate from the fact that they're humans as everyone else, but precisely because they're trans. So let me make an example. For example, when the NGO would disregard the trans experience, and take and you know choose the documents, whatever the gender is in the documents, and place the person based on that in the housing, they're putting them in an unfair situation because if the document says they're male, but this person is a female, and they're putting them in all male households, they're subjecting them to violence. And I think this is where it's important that we do not lose track of that. I understand, and you know, we have to be working towards the dignity of everybody. And the reason why I'm bringing up human rights is because. I still see in so many contexts where that, um, that, that people impose exceptions, right? That they say, of course I'm for human rights, but I'm anti this or I'm not for this. And I don't think that that's correct. But I also think that we have to understand those very specific challenges that people experience and work to, um, to um, address those ones. Okay, uh, so Raza, please. Uh, hi, uh, so my name is Kesar and uh, I'm joining from Lahore. Well, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Mr. Amir and uh, Vahid Saab, uh, you know, for organizing, uh, yeah, such a wonderful talk, you know, I mean, like it's uh, mind opening and there are so many things to learn from here, you know, so thank you very much for inviting and uh, yeah, uh, you should keep on doing it and uh, I would love to be part of it, you know. Um, so uh, living in Lahore and uh, like what Dr. Lane Munir said, you know, and then listening to Lilith and uh, Tina Dixon, you know, that she did a research in Lahore. So I was thinking like every day I'm driving in Lahore, you know, and then every day when I'm like stopping at a traffic light, you know, my, you know, window is being knocked and then there is some transgender, you know, like who is asking for money and for some favors or whatever, you know, so like, uh, yeah, they're involved in like profession which are not being liked, you know, and I was thinking like, uh, about their self-esteem. Uh, I'm going to talk about like uh, some of the behavioral issues, you know, I mean, I know that, uh, you know, um, a lot of talk has been done on uh, laws and uh, the national laws and the international laws, you know, and then the discrepancy between uh, the law and what is really happening in the society that has also been talked about, you know. So I was thinking that, uh, I mean, for me, law stands out to be like a big thing, which the government needs to cater to, you know, but as, if the word goes right, the commoners, you know, like the persons who are like, uh, you know, dealing with the people, you know, what about social, cultural and religious intervention, which could, could can be done on small level, you know, in order to improve the lives of uh, these people, you know, and I must say that, uh, you know, the way Lilith was speaking and looking at her, you know, being so bold, confident, beautiful, you know, it's so refreshing to see that, you know, I mean, uh, and I would love, love to see like these women or transgender people on the streets to be like that, you know, I mean, like, why can't they have like the self-esteem, they can't, why can't they have the power and everything, you know, like everyone else has, you know, I mean, we shouldn't even say that there should be a normal, you know, which is not normal right now. I think that is why we're getting together, you know, so it's a, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a feeling, you know, like that you get that there should be uh, something uh, being done, you know, and I'm, I must, okay, I'll not take much of the time, but these are some of the views which I would really like to express, especially, uh, you know, living in Lahore and teaching in a university and like talking to people, you know, I must tell you that here people, you know, I mean, they have this mindset, most of the things that emanate from the religion, you know, as we all know, you know, I mean, people are very strongly sticking to the religious views and then obviously, you know, the cultural views, they also kind of become reflective of the religious views in certain ways, you know, so like, if Sharia is able to, you know, like, I don't know, if we are able to interpret Sharia in a way that is, uh, yeah, helpful for the transgender people, you know, and then that might be helpful in transforming the behavior of the people, you know, um, yeah, towards making people um, understand or be sensitive towards, uh, you know, uh, yeah, the feelings of the transgender people, you know. So I would like to propose something actually here, you know, like, uh, instead of just talking that, why can't we take on small interventions? You know, like uh, I'm like a professor in the university and I do research and I collect data uh, mainly about community medicine, which is my field, you know. But <laughs> listening to this talk, I was thinking maybe I should start collecting data about like my own field, you know, like uh, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease among these transgender people, you know. 
so yeah this is this is this is what uh, uh, my feeling is you know uh, well thank you very much i'll i'll stop talking and give the floor back to you thank you Lilith, you want to say something? Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, I listened to all of you guys and thank you for your uh, views and your suggestions. Um, I will go back to the... I have three things to say here. So I will go back to the uh, original talk of Dr. Lane Muni and point out two things. One is factual and the other one is uh, mythological. Um, so uh, factual is about me. Um, I fortunately didn't apply for the asylum. I remember when we were talking about her research, I was thinking it as an option, but uh, then I left it. And the reason why I left it that I will come back. Um, and she mentioned one more thing. There is a paradox in the Pakistani society that uh, trans people are not accepted as a part of the society but when it comes to uh, marriages or when it comes to childbirth trans women particularly are invited and are asked to give blessings and dance and um, like give make it a festive uh, occasion for the entire family i think that goes back to the hindu mythology of bhagwan ram uh, um, giving the power to the trans people and the intersex people that they can now either bless or they can either uh, give curse to the people and that's that's very common in all of the South Asia we know about it uh, they are always like do not get cursed by uh, Khwaja Sera because that will go direct to the heavens so that's thanks to Bhagavan Ram otherwise we wouldn't having that as well um, uh, but yeah so the second thing is, uh, we talked about patho pathologizing the trans people or intersex people. I think uh, we are still not collectively uh, around the universe in a place uh, where we can literally think outside the binary, uh, man and women. So, Everywhere you go, it doesn't matter, wherever you go, all around the world, things are either made for men or they are made for women. So I have a very uh, small example. In 2018, I got really sick, extremely sick, uh, and I had to be hospitalized here in Germany. And uh, they didn't realize in the beginning that uh, um, I'm a trans woman. But what happened that uh, as soon as I told them that I am, because I had to ex uh, tell them what kind of hormones I'm taking, what kind of medication I'm on, uh, what they did was they started to have a discussion, should I go to the male ward or to the female ward? And that's I'm talking about Germany 2018. And I come from a very privileged place. I'm an educated person. Um, I know my rights very well. Uh, and I know what uh, and how to get them so I told them okay put me in the mail ward I don't care but then you have to give me a written document saying that why you put me in the mail ward and then we can talk about it later once I'm healthy enough and after 30 minutes they decided to give me a single room and that's Germany forget about Pakistan there you get raped and uh, people are saying, oh, you got raped, you're a trans woman. Rape laws doesn't apply on you because you're not uh, a woman. Uh, we know that there is the section 375 of the penal code uh, where a man can only rape a woman. And that's it. And then we have the 377 section which actually penalizes you if you get raped as a trans woman of sodomization that you have convicted the act of sodomy now you should be charged and punished according to the 377 penal code so the discrepancies all that uh, dr lane we talked about are all there and i don't know how they're going to work on it but they have come up with a really good transgender rights bill i hope it works last but not the least uh uh Kassar, as i said that uh, why can't everyone be bold and 
everyone be so uh, confident like me um even nobody should have to be like me and the the reason why i'm confident and bold is my own personal journey and i'm not going to make anyone feel bad about it but that why can't they be like me because everybody has their own personal journey and we should respect that and the thing that they see on the on the roads that people are pushed to beg uh i think the society should ask themselves why do they allow that people should be on the streets and begging for their lives and be made to beg to earn the livelihood made to have sex work to earn their livelihood and made to be pushed along the boundaries of the society where they do not have any other choice but to dance on your on your happiness days and other than that there is just sorrow and that's a societal problem and then you can always have those uh, connotations coming from the religious communities and non religious communities i won't go into that because that's something which uh, is very complex and everybody to his own thank you yes it's different um i have a question about like the you know um what was spoken earlier about the context within refugee camps where trans people are still exposed to like transphobic uh, environment and like uh what if anything is currently happening like in terms of that in terms of combating that that's that's my question Um, Tina, do you have anything to say? Um, I was just going to respond. Sahar, good question. Um, I know that Germany is, uh, Lilith, maybe you can clarify, is the first and only country in the world to create a transgender LGBTIQ plus only refugee welcoming center. Um, they were in talks about it, and last I read, they were trying to find funding to build this queer refugee center in Germany. Lilith or Tina, have you heard about the status of this particular refugee center? So we do not have just one refugee center that is for LGBTIQ plus people. Um, there are a lot of them. Uh, we have one in Cologne. We have a couple of them in uh, Berlin is there one. There is one in Hamburg and Stuttgart and uh, the other states in the federal republic of germany are also joining in but the problem is um, the germany is a federal state and all the federal states are actually responsible for the housing of uh, lgbti and other refugees it doesn't matter which refugee you are so then they have to decide what they have to do with the housings and it goes all up to the um, uh, community level which we call commune in german which is more like a small um, district uh, or a very small city uh, which has to take its own decision when it comes to refugees and asylum seekers and their housings. Um, so it depends. Either you have a status already, then you are allowed to go and free to move around where you want. But once you are in the process of asylum seeking, it depends from state to state. If they have the facilities, they might put you in the only LGBTIQ plus housing. Uh, but that has its own um, pros and cons. Pros are that you are safe with among the community. And the con would be that if the housing, uh, if the house is familiar to the people who are against LGBTI people, uh, you might uh, get a lot of problems. People might follow you back home. People might know who you are and where you live and they can uh, rape you even in the street. Anything can happen. So it doesn't matter where you live in this world. As I said before, being a woman is very hard. It's not easy. It's extremely hard to be a woman and then being an LGBTIQ plus woman, that's even harder. Thank you. Tina? Um, for Australia, it's slightly different because at the moment, um, the only people who are placed in immigration detention are those who um, come to Australia without a valid visa. And in the past, um, there was lots of people coming um, from South Asia by boat, and then with this government 
and lots of really terrible policies um, that seem to stop or at least publicly stop because they're turning votes away. Um, however, when people are in detention, there is nothing there that specifically is for LGBTQ plus people, no protections, no special zones. Um, I haven't really heard of um, cases of trans people in detention, but those, for example, queer women, while they were in women specific sections where they sleep, for example, the all of the communal areas and mixed gender, which exposes people to lots of risks. And there is no training for detention staff. There is no um, advertisement, no groups, no anything, no connection to any organizations for LGBTQ people. I think the issue as well is that um, in Australia, LGBTQ plus sector does not really engage in any refugee work at all, for most part of it. Um, and so it becomes up to, you know, those people, um, those refugee advocates who are visiting detention centers to think and identify people, but that's um, really patchy and, and not necessarily um, happening and we don't have any specific housing programs as well. Um, housing that's provided to people um, is mostly provided by charity organizations um, if there are places available because in Australia any social housing is only um, for permanent residents or citizens. So a lot of people are left on their own especially if they so very often people really fear to disclose who they are to um, refugee organizations, that fear of discrimination and persecution, whether that's real or not, because of those years of trauma and violence, people um, treat those organizations as places who can potentially discriminate. And so if they do not go to their services for support, they're just completely left on their own um, in the place. Yeah, Zedi, uh, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, it's already done. What's Mark yet? So, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, I have a question to Lilith. Uh, the subject of our session is transphobia. Transphobia, uh, transphobia is, of course, is visible in Europe, but not as uh, uh, horribly like uh, India or Pakistan. Not India, but in Pakistan especially. But the thing is, uh, we, we can uh, point out the problem and the misery of uh, our society and how the society is behaving against transgenders. But I think we can, we can also suggest some solution. For example, what I personally am thinking in bureaucracy, we have two different kind of behavior once we see in Iran. Iran is, uh, is supporting uh, um, uh, transgender surgeries. I don't know the reason behind. Uh, Lilith can, can explain us. But in Pakistan, we can use um, uh, theocracy, mullahs, priests, imams. They have to talk in a, in a prayer of Juma and say to people, these are human beings, the God it is a is just like us, so we have to respect uh, them with with the uh, care and uh, as a human being. So, uh, because I am very touchy uh, uh, violence against transgenders in Pakistan, I have personally seen uh, uh, sometime uh, violence. Uh, it brought them to death. It's 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 horrible, really, and I'm missing this uh, this uh, this. Uh, issue in this session, the, how people are uh, uh, bringing them to death. So we, we can't ignore it. So this uh, mic to uh, Lilith, actually. Lilith, would you like to respond to that? Or? Yeah, sure. Um, um, OK, so I will have to uh, do it uh, chronologically. So um, first of all, Iran. Um, Iran does. Uh, assist transgender people to go through their surgeries and uh, help them have their uh, sexual reassignment surgery so SRS and pay half of the money when it comes to uh, the fee uh, but the thing is uh, Iran is also a country where um, gay people 
especially gay men and lesbian women if one of the gay couple uh, is more feminine or more masculine then the feminine counterpart has to become a woman or in a lesbian relationship the 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 more masculine lesbian women has to become a man so it's not helping anyone actually to be honest and then the thing is not all trans people have to go through surgeries we must understand this that it is not compulsory it should not be compulsory anywhere around the world that people should be asked to go through surgeries unwillingly if they want to very good if they don't want to nobody should push them because you can die even uh, and people do die if they do not get proper uh, medical attention uh, then the the second thing is that uh, uh, the death of trans people we must uh, uh, also know that that there are trans men we are not talking about them in the in this talk not too often which are from uh, female to male and once you become man and i know so many trans men around the world you appear as a man publicly and you you are taken and perceived as a man by everybody you do not get the same amount of violence as trans women do so the death part is very much exclusive for the trans women and there could be many reasons behind it the, the very basic reason is how dare you step down from being a man to a woman it's a step down process it's not a step up process and from women to a man it's a step up process so now you are our equal you are a man now you are our buddy you are our pal we celebrate you but you born as a man and given this gender marker as a man how dare you become a woman so that's one of the things what could be done is very simple is acceptance acceptance in the society and theocracy will play a very big deal in it um i'm sure about it because it's one of the pillar of the society a religion is there then you have media how do you represent trans people then you have the education system does education system cater for trans people as uh, persons living in the society and talk about them in a positive way look at all theater theatrical um performances in pakistan trans people are mocked at there is no one single theatrical performance in pakistan where they do not mock trans people especially trans women and then trans women are still called by the male ending uh, verbs in in urdu language in punjabi in all the languages that we have we have a very male and female divided language we are not like uh, uh, like english language where you do not have the verb endings of male or female differently it's 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 extremely patriarchal language system that we also have do we change that no we don't you always refer to a trans woman as a man we don't refer to her as a woman we don't think of her as a woman because for us the woman is actually somebody who is born with a vagina and even then a woman the next step is then the woman is better if she can give birth and then the better woman is the one who can have children and be a mum so so you have categories of women in in the society too so so once you start accepting women the way they are regardless of being cis or trans heterosexual or homosexual or whatever the sexual orientation is then there will be a change otherwise i don't see any change because people do have problems with trans women if they do not even like like we we use a very specific word in in our uh, jargon it's like passing and non passing who passes the best of the binary systems if somebody looks like a woman or doesn't look like a woman that's how you your gender expression is how you uh, appear in the society so if you do not pass the gender expression of the society as a trans person you are not accepted as part of the society why why do you have to always look for i don't know 
okay she looks like a woman but is she operated or not i am very much interested in that no i'm not going to tell you if i'm operated or not no you do not have any right to ask me if i'm operated or not you have no right to ask me if i'm trans or not that's also one thing i have the right to tell i have the right to explain if i am or if i am not so all these things are are very much combined with one another and it all starts from very beginning from school from childhood from your family all these transphobic issues that i am having in germany it's not because uh, the entire society is transphobic it's because in your family you have transphobic people in your family you have people who do not respect human beings as human beings and differentiate between them on the basis of their gender on the basis of their color this is also where the racism comes into place these are all intermingling things because because we think there are certain humans who thinks that they are the best human in the world because of certain um, biological attributes that they have it might be their skin color it might be their biological gender it might be their position in the society it might be anything it might be their color of the eyes i don't know i have blue eyes that's why i'm better than you because you have black eyes it's absurd the way the society works but we have to think about these very look very small things once we start thinking about it then there will be a change and i think the families especially they are very much responsible about inculcating transphobia inculcating racism inculcating classism into their children that you are not allowed to play with somebody okay. who doesn't have a, a, a car or who doesn't uh, fit into the societal norms of yours thank you can i comment on that lilith yeah please I think you're totally correct but the basis the very bottom line is equality uh, if without equality you can never have whether it be trans or homosexual or heterosexual or black white pink purple it doesn't matter until humans decide humans are all equal you take dogs or cats or lions or tigers or elephants they're all the same but there is equality among a herd of elephants there is equality among dogs or cats they all they're all cats, they're all dogs, they're all elephants, they're all lions and tigers. Humans are the only race on the planet that wants to differentiate between one or the other. And, and th does a cat really care whether another cat has brown hair or gray hair? Or And why do humans do that? And that's what needs to be taught to all humans from birth on is that we're humans, that is our race. And that is what we have to work with. And it doesn't matter what color, what, what, what anything. The second thing, I think somebody mentioned Iran. And from what I understand is the mullahs in Iran had decided that the operation, the sexual operation was a cure for homosexual, homosexuality. If you're a homosexual, you had the option to cure yourself by becoming the gender that you wanted to identify with that was the that was the the mind on the, the meeting of the their their action on that at one time i think it was full paid for now lilith i think you said it was half paid for but it doesn't really matter in germany it's paid for by the health insurance so it doesn't really matter as far as acceptance i find i'm not the best looking woman in the world and i'm not the not the youngest one either but if i look and really look at people i see people being judgmental of everybody period and this is you know there's a woman on the train and she looks at me and has this funny little look on her face like yeah how dare he or she or whatever and then she turns around and sees someone else and has the same expression i like okay no problem you're just that way i can understand that but that's here. I don't know why, but Stuttgart seems to be extremely tolerant and welcoming in everybody. That's what I, that's my personal findings. I don't know. Come on, Stuttgart, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mesha, Mesha, you have raised your hand. 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for the beautiful and informative uh, talk. Secondly, if you hear any funny noises in the background, I am uh, sorry for that in advance. Lastly, I had a question about the healthcare system discrimination, which is, I think, already answered by uh, Dilith. However, um, I understand that there is a general stigma uh, against the transgender people. And, but what uh, Lilith just mentioned to step up and step down, my question is about that. Um, when there is a trans woman or a woman who is stepping up, sorry, a trans man, I meant, who is stepping up to be a man, um, why would it be different? Wouldn't it be the same stigma and same uh, phobia against it? And wouldn't it be like, yeah, I'm trying, a feeling to put it into the words. So how would it be like when you're stepping down to become a woman and it's more difficult, but not for a man, stepping up to be a man is not difficult. Secondly is that uh, she mentioned about the discrimination against uh, in the medical system. Um, does she see, like uh, she mentioned one example, but my question is about when she goes to a general practitioner and is it the same against all uh, the people, like transgender people? That's it. Lilith, would you like to answer? Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry. Um, so... Um... The stepping up and stepping down uh, thing, it was a very private thing and it was a conversation between my therapist and myself. Uh, and the second thing is also the statistics which indicate that trans women get killed every two days uh, around the world, uh, at least, and that's the homicides that we have. It's all embedded in the patriarchy. Um, Patriarchy is responsible for that. Who has more worth in a society? Let's get out of the trans uh, spectrum at the moment. Look at the cis spectrum as well. Do men have more power or do women have more power universally? Who has to keep a pepper spray in her purse and who doesn't? Who has to be vigilant about who is following her and who doesn't. Who has to be careful about what she's wearing and what she's not in a public domain. These are just very simple things. So the, the, the privilege that comes with a male appearance or with a male body is different than what it has uh, with, with the female body or with the female appearance. And that's why I think there, there is a discrepancy between men and women. It, it, it is still there. We all know that trans women and trans men are not the majority around the world. We are just a very minute minority uh, within a minority, which are the LGB uh, people. Uh, and the second thing is that in, in the journal uh, practice, uh, there are literally no, uh, I would say... Um, what was the question? Sorry, uh, discrimination, right? So in the in the journal uh, practice, there are no discriminations. Like uh, we, I have my doctors, uh, my GP, and they are all okay with it. It's always about when you have gender segregation, then the problems comes up. So if you have gender segregation around the world, men and women, and then appears a trans person who is still not operated, but the document says, oh, female. Uh, the biology says, no, not. And you have to explain that to the doctor, then they get confused, even in a country like Germany. So in Pakistan, then there are other issues if we talk about. So so it's, it's, it's very complex. And the, the basic thing, I will go back again, it's like the general perception of trans people in the society. How do we perceive trans people? First of all, and the other thing is in the medical field, especially, I think it should be more uh, inclusive of all people, regardless of their gender identity. It doesn't matter. It should be more inclusive how we treat a person's body, 
when this body has any ailment rather than going into the factor what does a body appear like doctors do know how they have to tackle about certain things and in going in an emergency to the doctor and then they are deciding whether to put you in a male or female ward that was the most absurd thing i ever 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 experienced if i might add to that a little yes, bit please, um, yes we've had a recent study conducted in australia on the experiences of trans and gender diverse people accessing healthcare so the study comprised of over 500 individuals and um about a third of them reported that they always had to educate their health professionals on trans um, health issues, which I never think is helpful when you are there going seeking help. Um, one in five people had um, the general health care refused to them. 14% were verbally harassed and 6% um, were subjected to unwanted sexual contact. So even in uh, places where we do think of healthcare as that system that is not going to be discriminating with a lack of appropriate training, appropriate specialization for GPs, for general practitioners, um, those experiences are still happening. Um, when we think of this um, specific access to healthcare, for example, it is um, really not common where um, trans men um, are not referred to cervical um, cancer screening, for example, and then people um, not necessarily tracking their health. So there's lots of issues where without an understanding of the doctor, they're going to miss out on those very key preventative measures of their health care because, um, you know, they're sort of glossed over and excluded in the system. And I don't think it is so much here about um, you know, whether you're a trans woman or trans man, it is more about the willingness of doctors to learn and to adapt their knowledge and their practice to actually meet um, the needs of their patients. I just wanted to ask, this point was mentioned earlier about the realities of the legal versus the actual experiences of Pakistani transgender people. Uh, and I'm wondering like how much of that knowledge that is being um, reintegrated into asylum laws and practices in the US. So just maybe the current state of that. You can, Lane, can um, you I can just that? briefly answer that. Um, I guess the challenge here, so in the Australian context, and I can only speak of that, um, the decision makers have to always take into account the country reports that are made by, um, on the one hand, human rights bodies, and then on the another Australian government department. And the challenge sometimes with LGBT plus cases that decision makers are looking for those extreme cases of violence, but also very explicit legislative discrimination um, of those cases. And if you come from a country where on paper and on law, you seem to be fine or you seem to be able to relocate to the capital, for example, it is become sometimes to people extremely difficult to prove that regardless of the that um, legislation factor, regardless that there is no legislation explicitly criminalizing you or limiting your opportunities, it is so often the societal pressure the impossibility to seek any um, justice from violence, it's just familiar violence that actually puts people at so much of the possible life opportunities that, you know, they just have no chance of, of living who they are. And I think in that sense, the migration policy and migration legislation is actually really behind, not able to sort of track that or seeing that, you know, when we see the country that, for example, decriminalized or same-sex relationships or for example you know the example in Mexico Mexico has same-sex marriage and yet they have the highest rate of murdering of trans women you know and so just having that legislation doesn't mean that that trans people are safe in that context and yet you know the migration law will still be really behind in recognizing that and it's going to depend on a decision maker whether they're trained enough whether they're sent sensitized enough to actually know um, the situation and to understand those case-by-case -case, um, scenarios as opposed to just making this blanket decision that there's no law, that's you are safe and you can return. I totally agree with Tina. It's uh, almost the same, almost the same in Germany as well. Uh, Mr. Said, uh, can you please unmute yourself?
Yeah, hello. Hello. Do you yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Go uh, हाँ जी भट्टी साहब मैं ये बात करूंगा उर्दू में आप इनको ट्रांसलेशन कर दीजिएगा अपना अंग्रेजी में ठीक है सबसे पहली बात ये है कि ट्रांसजेंडर के हवाले से कुछ सवाल हैं जो ट्रांसजेंडर दुनिया में बहुत तेजी से ये लोग फैल रहे हैं ठीक है और इससे लोगों ने कारोबार बना लिया हुआ है ठीक है और इस कारोबार की, की वजह से आम लोगों में एक तसर पैदा होता है जो मर्दाना कमजोरी की वजह से किसी ना किसी हवाले से अगर वो कमजोर होते हैं तो वो ये शक करते हैं कि जो है ना हम भी ये जेंडर ट्रांजेक्शन में आते हैं कि नहीं और हालांकि उनके बच्चे होते हैं उनकी औलाद होती है लेकिन ये जो जेंडर ट्रांस है इनकी वजह से बहुत सी परेशानियां लोगों में पैदा हो रही हैं इसके अंदर जो है इस कारोबार की वजह से लोग अपने आप को सेल करते हैं और ये आसान बिजनेस बनाया हुआ इन लोगों ने ठीक है और इस आसानी से पैसा कमाने के लिए ये लोग जो हैं अपना आसान तरीका इन्होंने ढूंढा है जबकि मैं जानता हूं बहुत से लोग जानते हैं कि ट्रांसजेंडर जो हैं ये मेहनत भी कर सकते हैं ये अपना सिलाई कढ़ाई दफ्तरों में काम कर सकते हैं और जिससे जो है ना ये आ, अपनी मेहनत से पैसे कमा सकते हैं जब जबकि ये कारोबार दुनिया में बहुत तेजी से फैल रहा है दूसरी बात यह है कि मैं होम्योपैथिक डॉक्टर भी हूं मैं यहाँ पर मैंने मास्टर किया है हमारे मटीरा मेडिका में जो अलामत दमागी आती हैं इन लोगों की वो बहुत ज्यादा लोग ये तंदुरुस्त होते हैं और ये अगर इनको होम्योपैथी की दवाई दे दी जाए तो इनसे जो है ना अम्यून सिस्टम इनका हर स्थल हो जाता है हर स्थल से मुराद है कि एक्टिव हो जाता है जिससे अच्छा भला तंदुरुस्त आदमी एक अच्छी वाली जिंदगी गुजार सकता है तो ये आ, मेरा सवाल ये है कि ये ये लोगों को जो जिन लोगों की ये कारोबार बनाया हुआ जिन लोगों ने उसको उनको चाहिए कि वो लोगों को मोटिवेट करें कि जो है अगर अपना इलाज होम्योपैथिक तरीके से जो सादा तरीका है आसान तरीका है उसकी तरफ जो है ना ये मायल हो ये जो दिमागी अलामत होती है इन लोगों की बिजनेस in the world and he is thinking in his uh, learning and his observation and his personal opinion like translation at uh, a transgender is becoming like a disease and he has uh, a cure uh, in the homeopathic uh, pills which he has uh, making something and there's so many other things which uh, is totally his own opinion and his own personal uh, perspective so uh, in in the start of the beginning we said here we are trying to unpack all the translation and our own uh, biasness and i'm just um, i'm not saying or uh, want to go in uh, any argument but the thing is that we are really uh, last minutes of our suggestion so thank you uh, up for sharing your own opinion so lilith um so first of all uh, being trans is not a disease uh secondly conflating all the gender and uh, sexual spectrum is not going to help anyone uh people have different gender identities and people have different sexual orientation and transgender identity has nothing to be nothing to do with if somebody is able to reproduce or not able to reproduce reproduction is a very different thing uh <laughs> I literally feel attacked. I must say this. Um, it, feel you, Lilith. We feel you. Yeah. It's you know, it's like the answer. I mean, I feel like a lot of people are just kind of like, yeah. I I, I don't even know how to di di digest this comment that you have may found. I, uh, make a comment. Some, that that somebody has found a cure for transgender identity, which is actually not a pathology to begin with. 
um, it's not a disease to begin with. Um, we are all part. So th that's where the, the, the thing is that all black people have to explain to all white people, oh, you are racist. So all trans people have to explain to all cis people, hello, we are sane. We are not insane. You people are misunderstanding us. You do not have that. It's actually the other way around. I think I'm not diseased. It's it's a disease in the cis community that they cannot understand what does it actually mean to be a trans person. And they think that we need to be corrected. This is what Iran is doing by providing money to correct people of the disease so that they should either have a vagina or a penis and fit in the binary system of being a man or a woman. This is this is all absurd. This is something which we need to really eradicate and it's not a business. I asked a question that will be my last comment. I asked a question a few years ago that if by accident a man loses his balls is unable to reproduce will that man be willing to live his life as a woman for the rest of his life the answer was no because your balls are not your gender identity your Competency, biological competency of reproducing is not your gender identity. It's in your head. And it has nothing to do if you get your penis up or not. I'm sorry for using this language, but that's how it has to be very clear. Thank you. I think I, think I, I, I heard Lilith's answer and... and Judging from the answer and reconstructing back what the question probably would have been, uh, I think it's in a, in a way I'm happy that gentleman asked that question because this is exactly what transphobia is defined as. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to be, to be very direct here because this is precisely uh, what we are trying to uh, make people aware about. This is what precisely what we are trying to uh, tell people that it's not a disease uh, it's not something by choice. It is not something you take a few, you pop your pills and you think you will be back to normal person again because you de deviated for some reason, you, you got infected, uh, you got a kind of sexual corona or biological corona or some kind of uh, gender corona. And uh, if you start wearing the mask, that will go away. I mean, that's that doesn't happen that way. Uh, and I think this 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 was, and it's, extremely good that this question came up because it kind of uh, shakes up the discussion and, and puts it on the right track, to be honest. Because our purpose here today and always has been and today is that we want to create exactly the awareness and, uh, and the questions and the input and the Lilith's comments and our and Lane and Tina. And I think I am shaken, to be honest. And you must be a person made of wood or clay if you are not shaken by hearing all these comments, these stories and these insights. Because this is what it was meant to be, to understand the situation of LGBTI. And now you know why we use the word plight. And this is exactly what it comes down to be, because if there are people who don't see them as normal human beings, as that gentleman said that cats never say your skin of uh, your skin color or you have stripes and I don't. And, and this helps us to understand the lives of uh, LGBTI people and their traumas. Uh, we have to challenge these norms. We have to have this debate. We have to open up. We have to talk with everyone with dignity. And, and as, I, as I said in the introduction, while preparing for this dialogue, when we met several people and many people from LGBTI, uh, it shook us up. I mean, many things we, we unconsciously, we, we, we are progressive, we pretend to be progressive, but sometimes we don't even know what we are talking about. So gender identity here really in, in, in our view, in, in OPP and in Women Connectors view, 
is really is not up to others to decide that hey i am i am come to you as a doctor you are a doctor and and cure me for this no and we cannot put a stamp on anyone what gender he or she must have or what gender identity a person should have it's a person herself or himself or everything in between to decide what they want to be and we got to respect that and we got to respect that with dignity and the more you get engaged with these people the more you talk to lgbti people the more you will feel that they are more than normal come on man not just normal more than normal they are wonderful people and and i am so happy that uh, in this life we met a lot of uh, lg uh, lgbti people and they have enriched our knowledge our lives and our experiences and on this note i would like to yeah uh, here uh, dr ishtiaq and uh, dr lashari and bashir said they would be uh, they have raised their hands and uh, yeah sure sure of course of and course later we we can close it dr sir a uh, two doctors we have now uh dr ishtiaq can you please unmute your yes yes yeah. i have uh, i've done it no i think this was a case of transphobia it is good that uh, mohammed sai saab presented his views which are brutal but that's how i think a very vast majority of people think and in a way he brought to the table what we intellectuals trivialize the reality of society and our ability to transcend uh, those things and believe that because we have become aware this world can be changed easily i have you know when i was teaching human rights Uh, in pakistan i used to give assignments to my students you know for a short assignment and two of them a girl and a boy chose to root, uh, write on transgender and both came back with shocking evidence i mean i have gone through life with so many shocks that even i found them uh, unpalatable the things i i learned but what i was told was that at least those who are biologically different the the families themselves give away the children they don't keep their children in the family they are given away to these communities i think dr dixon will have to uh, 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 confirm what i'm saying because i had a paper two papers written on it and both concluded and the second thing was that from their findings it was only men who were transgenders so women transgender in pakistan probably have it far more difficult to come out and and speak about the problem but what happened to these transgender men they are given away by their families and nobody wants to rent out houses for them to to live in so they have nowhere to go and we found evidence which is shocking you know about how religious people abuse it i'm sure others can do it too but this was the examples i learned for example there was one haji saab has a shop on beden road i went there just to look at him a uh, big name very pious and all that he rented out a three story building to the transgender yes. uh, thank you mr uh, sorry we have to wrap up so i really request yeah yeah uh, just a moment let me speak ha uh ha -huh. uh -huh. so just a moment we need the counter evidence to say that this is not uh, something which people are doing as a business what is the reality so the thing is that uh, 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 this haji saab rented out the house to these people and then married with children he would come in the evening and sleep with these uh, ban also as a part of his own uh, you know that he was the uh, landlord so i mean so severe is the persecution of uh, uh, transgenders in pakistan and i was not charmed when i heard uh, lilith talk about ram and uh, his statement on uh, i i am i find religious uh, you know references very very uh, very very irritating because ram is the man who let his wife stay in the jungle for 14 years on a mere a uh, a uh, uh, suspicion of her infidelity so if he made any such chance statement it's no reason to believe that 
we have this tradition from there anyhow so i, I and and somebody was saying that we should go to the sharia and see if we can apply that no sorry you have to have a secular democratic pluralist society as your framework in which you can do all these things after all europe you know australia canada new zealand only in the 70s abolished the race laws so nobody who was non white could emigrate you know with all the normal sort of uh, background in his baggage so this is a very recent thing that societies are learning how to handle you know uh, 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 the plural the, the pluralism <laughs> which constitutes the world and transgenders and the rest they are on the margins of society we have to bring them in so i think i would end there yeah, yeah. we take La dr lashari as last question anand sir Yeah. Uh, no, actually, I don't have the question, but I had to say that was actually said by Dr. Ishtia Kamen. So I was just to uh, say that Lalit reminded me Judith Butler's uh, saying that uh, gender is not something that's biological sex, but that it is actually the performance. So when I have, a, I, I have analyzed some kind of poetry in Hindi, then I came to know even the poets. Uh, are the poet both the genders were there, but they were talking differently somehow, you know. Uh, then uh, question is there that when we are facing here the problem of theological uh, coding of the law or the religious things, you know that we are facing in the case of Professor Sajid Sumru or Madam Ulfan Amala that we don't have any kind of narrative even to speak like Dr. Ishtia Kaman that even when if if you are not getting out of that. a dilemma that you have to go to accept some kind of things kind of narrative even then you can't have these kinds of spaces like gap we can't afford that kind of luxury that we have speak like lilitha we can speak like tina other people are speaking in the europe uh, what they have uh, been thinking about the things so i i think this is kind of luxury we can't afford in pakistan uh, because uh, we we don't have even to talk about the law and that theological philosophical stage and we are facing that kind of narrative and to create that kind of narrative all the parliamentarians are keep the quiet on the issues that if you have to talk about something you have to go for the liberal new liberal uh, the theories or philosophies even philosophy is prohibited uh, here to speak so that is the problem i am feeling that what, what to talk about the things uh, about the narrative which she was talking lately as for the sake of language gender words uh, pronouns Uh, whatever we have around all these things, so uh, I, I feel very difficult to speak and say such things as well. But definitely, I I, I agree with the Dr. Shri Akram. But but they have said we need that kind of narrative. Hopefully, you know, uh, unless we may have these kinds of things uh, like this kind of you know webinar, seminars, and narrative things, we can't find any book regarding these. one of my friend was doing the research on this on the language of the transgenders and you know that when we came to came to contact with the, those people they have been speaking different language that was not the language of society even they were not speaking hindi punjabi urdu or english whatever the language they were saying their narrative of transgender was different that when we are not accepted there as kind of gender then definitely we have to create our own language we have to create our own words pronouns or whatever the things we have even adjectives they have their differently what adjectives we have for the good people bad people or whatever things they were so so i i think this is all beyond uh, from our conception or the uh, dream of comment of these things and i appreciate the pp and thank you so much for arranging this kind of wonderful in life in session and the speak of lilith tina and dr stark and all of all, all of the people thank you so okay thank you i think uh, 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 just just one just one person uh, is uh, dying to comment mubashir please thank you so much uh, of course it infuriated me but at the same time i would really like to reiterate what i said in the beginning that i think it was a wrong beginning to sort of come from a very biological standpoint that hi what causes that bichare with pity and condescending way of thinking 
what causes it and sort of presenting all the biological explanation. So let's not get there. The only way forward is human rights, liberal, secular way of thinking. And that's what we can sort of include everybody. And that's the exclusion uh, sort of language that I was talking about when you take pity on people. And I think that actually emerges from that biological explanation that what causes that? Achha, in, 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 technical defect hota hai. You know, all that stuff. So let's please not get there. And let's start from a human rights perspective. I would really like to sort of okay. reiterate. And of course we are learning through this process and this is for the future conversations no, through I, this platform or any other. Thank you very, very much. It's a very, very good, positive, uh, comment uh, to conclude, I think, uh, absolutely uh, agree with you. And uh, Ramsa, when you put the last uh, quote on and then uh, what we will we'll do is we will end in a couple of minutes, the official session, and but we will keep the lines open for about another 40 minutes if people want to have informal discussion or say something, but officially we are uh, next one. Uh, yeah, please. Just, just, just closing, uh, uh, because I think a lot has been said. I don't need to say anything other than that. That when was it last time someone was hurt by equality? I think uh, one gentleman uh, uh, put a lot of emphasis on equality. And uh, Mubashi just now said as well, we start from human rights. And I think this is where if we believe on equality, if we start with equality in the families, in the society, at workplace, everywhere, no one is going to get hurt. Everyone is going to get better with, uh, if we treat each other with equality and dignity. And I think on, on that note, thank you very much to our panelists and all the people who attended uh, this and actively participated in it. Thank you very much. It was a very critical topic. And I think we learned a lot from each other, from everyone. Uh, I'm closing this session now officially. As I said, the lines will stay open for another 35, 40 minutes. Please feel free to stay online and have informal chat uh, if you wish. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you all.